Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by saying Minnesota is a Dakota and Ojibwe homeland. It's centered within Dakota creation stories and is also an important place in traditional Ojibwe history and the histories of other Native nations. It is both an ancestral and contemporary home to many Native people. The idea of home and homelands plays a central role in our recently developed exhibit, Our Home Native Minnesota. My name is Ben Gessner, and I'm the curator of the Native American Collections. I want to take the opportunity to encourage you all when you're ready to visit the Our Home exhibit and the beautiful artworks and stories that we have shared within that space. The History Center Museum is now open, and we welcome you to visit by reserving tickets online. So today I'm joining you again from one of our collection storage areas uh, in the lower level of the Minnesota History Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, I, before we start, I also want to acknowledge that museums in many ways have played a role in cultural interruption for Native people, and it's our responsibility to acknowledge and work towards repairing that. Museum collections can also play an important role in community health as community members work to revitalize language, food, and cultural artistic forms. So we have uh, Holly Young, incredible artist with us here today. Before I turn it over to Holly for uh, an introduction, I just wanna ask the audience to please leave questions in the chat. Staff are moderating that space and they will bring them up during the Q&A in about 40 minutes. Uh, and we're also going to invite you to fill out a short survey following the program today. So Holly, how are you? Who are you? Where are you joining us from? <laughs> Hi, Ben. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Holly Young. Um, I'm joining you right now from Bismarck, North Dakota, uh, where I make my home. I'm originally from Standing Rock. I'm enrolled there, um, 48 to be specific. Um, and I am a full-time and self-taught Dakota artist. And yeah excited for the program today yeah me too i think right before we started we were talking that we've known each other six or seven years now and you were one of the first um artists in the native american artists in residency program that we got to work with yeah um, and it's it, i was gonna say it's interesting to track time because when you were here you had your like seven-year-old daughter with you and now when we yeah. saw her the other day. <laughs> yeah, everybody outgrows me. Right? <laughs> she's, she's 14 now and taller than me. <laughs> yeah, but it's been it's been a long time. It feels doesn't feel that long ago though. I think it just went by really fast. Well, when you did your residency, you're really focused on um, Dakota floral beadwork. And I know today we're gonna talk a little bit about Dakota floral. We're also gonna talk about um, some of the ledger work that you've done in the past. I've pulled out some of your work here on the table behind me, this beautiful vest and a couple other pieces we'll get some uh, close-up shots of and uh, we'll, we'll chat about that. But um, also your, your ledger work is something that I wasn't super familiar with, you know, six, seven years ago when we were working together, but it's, but it is something that you are becoming more known for. And it's something that you're, uh, kind of diving into. So do you want to, I was wondering if you could describe to someone who might not know what ledger work is or ledger art, we call it ledger art, but it's got a history in the plains sort of pictorial uh, art that decorated lodges and teepees and high. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you, do you mind uh, talking a little bit about that? <laughs> not at all. So okay. yeah. Seven years ago, I also wasn't really um, learning anything about ledger art as well. Um, but yeah, as you said, now I'm kind of um, coming into ledger art a little bit more often these days. I'm kind of enjoying creating it. Um, but a little history on ledger art. Um, so um, it's about 100 years old. Um, it began with, you know, art in caves, on rocks, then it progressed to on hides, teepee liners. And then, you know, when the people um, were confined to the reservation um, and no longer hunting 
and no longer allowed to hunt, um, they lost access to um, those materials that they previously used, like, you know, lodges and um, hides. So um, the agents that were in charge of these agencies where the, you know, people lived um, had uh, ledger books that they kept um, track of the supplies that they gave to each family on. So the people got a hold of it and and I should say that this, um, the people, by the people I mean men, um, because this is a, it started out as a male dominant um, form of art. And so the men got a hold of these ledger books and started to um, tell, you know, their old stories and remember their old way, um, their old lives and so they drew and these are like narratives so these are stories that they're telling and thought were important to you know keep within the people or keep within the community or the tribe and um so these narratives were about war and hunting parties and ceremonies and dreams and visions and um courtship um and, da and their daily lives. So now, um, you know, so we know it as ledger art, but we try to say that it's like a Plains pictorial narrative or Plains pictorial um, art because ledger books are just only one of the many materials that the people use. So today, right now, as a contemporary ledger artist, and I'm still learning, I don't only use ledgers. I also um, utilize music sheets. So um, there's that. Yeah, well, let's talk about that a little bit. I, I was just going to say, like, we have here at the museum, we've got examples of um, painted hides and, and uh, you know, ledger work done, or, you know, Plains pictorial work done on hides, on uh, cotton and muslin. Um, we've got these, some of the only historic pieces of ledger art that we have come from a man uh, from your community, from Standing Rock named mm -hmm. Eagle Shield. And I know you've got a chance, just a chance to see them. I'm going to pull one up and then I'm going to ask that we also put uh, a digital image of one on the screen as well. But like you said, this is definitely, this is um, this man named Eagle Shield who sat down in the, in the, with uh, Francis Densmore and kind of told his story. He's like, you know, here's, here's how we escaped and here's this raid and here's, you know, when I stole three horses and here's another time when I, when I killed 10 crows <laughs> and things like that, you know, so it's old men sort of like you were saying, sort of recounting their, their, uh, their glory days and their, and their warriors. But what's also interesting about this is Densmore collected these, right? and then um, published them in her publication that became known as um, Titan Su Music. And so she worked with a number of people. I'm gonna grab a copy of that book really quickly. She worked with a number of people, again, men. Um, but what's interesting here is we've, you know, this was published in 1918, Bureau of uh, Ethnography, and Ethnology, I'm sorry. and. You know, it's got the, that picture that was just up on the screen, and then it's got a song that's associated with it as well. And so yeah. the song and the narrative and the, you know, the, the um, oral narrative and also the, the descriptive sort of artistic narrative, it all becomes part of this bigger, this bigger story. Is there a right. reason that, um, so speaking of music, is there a reason that you've chosen to use music uh, Sheet, like sheet music to draw on? Does it work uh, into your narrative in any kind of way? Yeah, yeah. Um, I use music sheets for different reasons. For one, when I first started out um, learning about ledger art, I didn't have access to um, old ledger or old ledger pages or old ledger books. And, and they're hard to find and they're getting even more difficult to find. Um, but I also, <laughs> to be honest, I didn't trust my own um, artistic 
ability at that moment. And I did not want to ruin, you know, the ledger paper that I had, and I only had a little bit. And so I started using the music sheets because I felt a little bit more comfortable and confident. And then I realized that the music sheets kind of had these words on them and these titles and, and those titles started to inspire me to, you know, create ledger work around, you know, what the, the words were saying or what the song was about. And so that's how that came about. I started to um, kind of take influence from those, those words and those music sheets. Well, I noticed a couple of, a couple of things when I'm looking at them here. I do notice that the you know plants are continuous, like continuing to influence you and and doing it in that sort of really traditional Dakota floral style. I was also going to ask you when you did your residency, we talked a lot about uh, Dakota women and when, you know, women's work and sort of how important it was for you to pass on to your daughter and to kind of explore what started with some objects or some personal items that your grandmother had. Yeah. So if men's work is sort of this traditional, or if uh, the ledger art was seen as men's work, have you sort of turned that around a little bit? Have you thought about it as women's work? Or are you telling any sort of women's stories in particular or anything? Yeah, like yeah, a lot of that. Um, so I, at first I felt a little hesitant, you know, because I didn't know much about ledger art and I'm still learning about a lot about it. Um, but just, yeah, I mean, knowing it was a male art form, I felt a little bit hesitant, like I said, but then I had, thought about my own personal history, my own family um, history. And I had some grandmas, you know, who were very influential to the art that I create today, but they did some very unique and um, unheard of things in their time. And one grandmother um, took up her husband's winter count after he passed away. Now, winter count making or creating is like ledger art. It is um, a male dominant art form. And the males were, you know, um, creating a calendar on a piece of hide. And so when he passed away, my grandpa, um, my grandmother took his um, winter count to keep up with it. And I had, you know, drawn on that. I had thought about the time she lived in and how abnormal that may have been. Um, I don't want to say abnormal. I would say unique for the time. And then I thought, well, if she did that, then, you know, what's holding me back from doing ledger art? And um, also, I think it's really important to convey, you know, a, a woman's point of view a woman's life, um, her experiences with being um, a mother and a relative and um, things that are um, specific to a woman's um, world. So yeah, that's how I, I started to, you know, grow and find um, confidence in creating major art from my point of view. I love it. Um, can we, let's, you know, we got so much to talk about, but let, can we also kind of introduce the Dakota floral beadwork that you've been doing? I might hold mm -hmm. up a piece or two that you've made that we've got in the collections here. And I know you've got some stuff there too, that some, one that's finished and one maybe that you're working on as well. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your perspective on, on, uh, Dakota floral, because, you know, just 10 years ago, it was not a very common or widely known, even in your community, widely known art form. I would say it was really sort of on the brink of being just not not well remembered. Yeah. And so I think artists like you and some other folks have worked hard on trying to bring that style back. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> Um, did you have a question, though? Did I? 
I'm sorry. We get all long winded. It just uh, no. I was wondering. Do, do you want to like maybe just talk about like your um, introduction to it? What kind of interested you in exploring it? And then even if you have a, a minute to talk about, maybe we can talk about what it was like to come here and work in collections and and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So like like you said about ten years ago, um, we we didn't see. I didn't see personally a lot of um, what we come to know as Dakota floral, but it goes by a lot of different names, you know, Eastern Sioux floral, East Santee floral, Santee Sioux floral. Um, but it was a floral that was um, in within our community at within, a, I should say, all Dakota communities at one point. And then that it just kind of faded out um, and we didn't see it being produced anymore. I didn't see it being produced anymore. And the reason I took it up was because, well, as a lady, I am drawn to floral. I love floral, it's really pretty. Um, but I, I had been nosy and I was digging through some things in my grandmother's house and I came upon some beadwork and some old quill work and it, um, it was floral and I had never seen any anything like that and so it got my mind really curious and I just then I began this journey of researching and then I reached out to you asking you if you had things in your collections and then I you know went from there then it took off and um, I don't know it, it's probably something that I'm known for because I'm so um, passionate about it because I I wanted to do it. I wanted to reintroduce it back into our lives so that you could see it everywhere and we could, you know, remember um, that our ancestors and our grandmothers created these things and they created them with purpose and there was a reason why they made these and, um, those reasons to me unknown at the time I felt were important though because they were they were doing this with purpose so um yeah so then I began to just create floral on everything and now it's on ledger work that I do so do you see the beadwork that you do and the floral work is sort of like very very separate in your in your mind or do you see elements kind of moving back and forth yeah, uh, in relation to ledger work, it's kind of the same in a way that it's a narrative, it's storytelling, um, it's an honoring, just like these men wanted to honor their old stories and honor their people by keeping track of the things that they had did in their old lives, um, is what women did with floral when they created it and put in beadwork and quill work, they were honoring the person that they were making it for, and they were honoring the um, the plants, which we believe are um, relatives to us because they take care of us and they sustain us. And so women were doing that just like men were creating ledger work. So there is, there's that, that similarity there. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. I was gonna just pull out, like this is a, this is a piece um, sorry about the lighting here, but this is quill work. And yeah. this would be that sort of the Dakota floral that we're talking about. And this is a historic piece. And this bag itself is a three-sided bag. Um, and you chose to make uh, your three-sided bag as well. That's part of the collection here. Is this a form that is sort of also associated with like... Um, is this like a woman's bag? Is it a pouch? Like what, what did you find out? Like what goes in here? What, uh, what's the significance of this particular form? I'm not sure it's a woman's bag, but I know that, you know, uh, when I was in, you know, in your collections over there, we found a lot of bags. And so that made me think how important these bags were. And then I also thought of, um, you know, the things we use when we pray, like tobacco or sage or, you know, um, 
things of that sort, any kind of medicine that you want to carry in it. So I think that I don't know if those bags, to be honest, are women related. Um, they may have been made by women, created by women for men or, you know, but I think they were used um, by both women and men. Well, so my next question, I've heard you kind of talk a little bit about like both when you say there's a significance to like the representation of plants, that the plants are really important to you culturally. And also how you just mentioned that like the pouch will contain medicines and stuff like that. Do you feel like, um, do you feel like there are cultural lessons that are sort of passed on through the making of this, this art? Do you feel like there's cultural lessons kind of coded in there? Yeah. Um, I, I think that, um, when, you know, when women were making these, um, garments and these creations for, um, their husbands or their children, they had their children amongst them, watching them. Um, and they also had relatives helping them create all of these things. It was like a team effort, you know, just kind of like how the women put a lodge up together. So um, it created kinship and it created a, a sense of um, depending on each other and a family feeling, you know, and also, you know, just teaching by um, having their kids observe what they were doing. And so, um, yeah. And then I also think that there's a lot of love <laughs> that goes into, into this work and um, how better to demonstrate your love and your care um, for your relatives by creating something um, that takes time and patience and dedication and, um, you know, things like that and then gifting them to to your relatives so yeah yeah i guess you know i also i would say like the longer that i work with collections especially the longer i work with community members specifically that come in and access collections i think the more i understand all of this revitalization happening around really i think community health like it when you revitalize food when you revitalize language when you revitalize these cultural practices that aren't just you know a nice beautiful art piece to look at they're actually you know used a cradle board is used by a mother you know or a family yeah. or a baby um the just and you know people that have come in and looked at lacrosse sticks in order to revitalize the creators game a lot of it seems like it centers around health and community health and well-being and love and so i'm really happy that you talked about that you know this idea of togetherness and how much love and care you know it it would take i also feel like on the other hand when we do that we look back and we see museums having a hand in uh interrupting some of that especially in the 1920s when we were really doing like salvage anthropology um and kind of just collecting for collecting sake what what is it like for you to come in and and work with collections and kind of know all of that because <laughs> you do yeah that. yeah yeah now i know that you know beginning my journey though like 10 years ago and starting to go into collections i kind of was naive and then as I, you know, I was on this journey of learning and researching, it kind of dawned on me, like, well, how did they get these creations? Where did they come from? Who do they belong to? What are their stories? Um, and then it was also like, you know, personally in, in my family, we have a story and I won't go into detail <laughs> out of respect, but we have a story of a relative that um, had to sell something that was really um, important to our family, but they sold it, you know, because they were experiencing hardship. So they had no, you know, um, no choice almost. And so I have those thoughts 
when I go into museums, like at first it began with, oh, how beautiful and how, you know, all of these things are on display for us. And then as I'm an artist myself and I'm making some of these things and I realize how much time and effort and love and energy and patience, I keep saying these things over, but these are a lot of emotion goes into creating these things. And so you go into museum collections and, and these things are in drawers, you know, and to me, and I know I'll, I, I'll speak for myself, but I look at them as relatives as well, um, or living creations. And, um, you know, a lot of these things were made for certain purposes, maybe even certain ceremonies. And so in those ceremonies, you know, they, and I'm talking about a bag here, or, you know, some, like a medicine bag or something. We want that bag to have interaction with the people, you know, that it's made for, you know, like to be in the ceremony. And so when you go into collections, um, they're not experiencing that. And so I know it sounds probably a little strange for the average person that I'm personifying these things, but that is how we view them because we know, you know, there's purpose and, and love behind the work. So yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I appreciate you being, um, honest about it. And I bring it up because we've had lots of conversations about it. Mm -hmm. and it museum field i think is rapidly changing and we're rapidly uh or well i would say we're always you know trying to do better and there's a lot of changing um practices and i'm happy to answer any of those questions or have a whole other public program where we can talk specifically, <laughs> uh, about it but i do appreciate you bringing it up and yeah. or, or or at least uh allowing me to bring it up well hard um, conversations can be had you know, I mean, it doesn't mean that we can't learn from this experience. And like you said, practices are changing and, you know, you guys are allowing people to come in whenever and, you know, you allow singing and smudging. And, and I don't think that, you know, not knowing, but I don't think that was ever the practice like 20 years ago. So that that's good that's making headway some in some manner yeah i think so too and this is a topic i could talk about all day long so we'll, <laughs> so we'll switch it and bring it back um i i wonder because you know i know that you've talked about sort of bringing this back especially the floral and how you want to see it in your community yeah um, and how you wanted to see it you know, you wanted to be around it. So you, so that was a, a motivating factor for bringing it back. Do you feel like um, there are parts of it that you can share with like a general audience with a non-native audience? Do you mind if people wear a pair of earrings that you, that you make no. there? Yeah. Yeah, no, not at all. I look at, you know, me being an artist and creating these things even floral work or ledger work as a almost like an invite to come in um, to sort of my world and my community's world. And because, uh, you know, I'm doing this because I'm a product of my community. And these ways are not only my ways, but these are the ways of my community. So I'm just highlighting, you know, what beautiful traditions we have. And so when I create art, it, like I said, it's an invite to come in, like you can buy a pair of earrings or a ledger piece. And then I hope, my hope is that it gets your mind going and that you wanna know more. And you wanna know more, you know, not only about me, but um, Dakota people in, in, in general, or Standing Rock community where I come from, or, you know, these, historical things whatever it, it triggers in your mind to want no, to want to know more i encourage that i i i actually look forward to that and um i want to have those conversations i may not always have um the i don't know best answers but if somebody's asking me questions i appreciate that 
see. Well, that is uh, really lovely. And I think um, I was going to ask you as well about you have a piece there that you've completed and also one that you're working on. Do you mm -hmm. mind uh, showing us or talking about your process a little bit? Yeah. Do you, uh, so I just have this kind of like, um, I, I don't know if we talked about this, but I do a little bit of teaching in different communities. And so I'm always practicing at home before I go in um, to a different community. So they have an example. And so this is a tobacco bag and, um, it, and it has floral on it. And so um, it's just, yeah, a visual for them to, to look at as you know i teach the class i go along um and then i so besides <laughs> beadwork and ledger art i like to do a lot of other things i mean whatever i i can learn i try to pick up if i could find a person to teach me i want to learn i just i don't know my brain works that way it just and sometimes you kind of get burnt out on certain things you do and you're looking for something else to just re-inspire you. And so um, I, I try to teach myself a lot of other things. So another thing that I've always wanted to do and I started, started experimenting with was um, making dolls. And so I don't know if you could see, but there's a doll behind me on the, on the shelf back there. And then I'm um, creating a second doll and um this is just her outfit for now so That's um, sweet. this is my <laughs> my daughter's teddy bear um but yeah so i i haven't made the doll yet oops but this is um her dress and her breastplate and her uh belt and um her dentelium cape and uh -huh. her yeah there is a lot of little details and um uh that go into dolls and it's it again makes you think about you know a long time ago when your grandmas were creating this again there was purpose you know they were creating um dolls to um you know show um their daughters or granddaughters how to be you know how to create as a woman and um all the little things that they put on the dolls all had a purpose and also you know were things that they were going to make as they grew older and had their own families so yeah there's always a cool story i'm i'm probably biased but there's always a cool story behind <laughs> all these creations well yeah absolutely some of the historic dolls that we have here that I think you've seen where the the women will have a knife sheath and an all case, yeah. and a tobacco bag and a belt and all the things that are important to, like you said, important to women yeah. as they as they grow and as they uh, things that they'll make and use. Mm -hmm. um, so also just uh, in about ten minutes we'll probably start taking some questions. From the audience so if anybody out there is watching and has any questions for holly you can put them in the chat um you know what else would you want to talk about what else do you have to say what what uh what got you i'm really curious about you you know you talked a little bit about um like growing as an artist and some of the growth that you've experienced. Um, do you feel like not only has your perspective changed, but like have your, I, you know, your concepts, your ideas about art changed as you've, from 10 years ago when you started this journey? Do you feel like more tied to the uh, cultural stuff you're learning or? You know? Yeah, um, it's definitely changed me personally um i think we talked about this a little bit earlier that you know um the reasons why i create art and i think those are important to talk about you know in a in a general way and in this really pretty kind of 
picture way. Um, I create art, you know, for my community, you know, to highlight my community because I'm not the only one that does all of this. And and there's really awesome bead workers and quill workers and artists in general from my community that, um, you know, they're not on social media. They don't have the platform that I have, you know. Um, and so I'm fortunate for for that, but I don't I don't forget them. You know, I still um, know they're there and creating. And um, but I also do it because, you know, also um, there's people watching. You never know, you know, who you're inspiring um, with in your journey. But I also think part of the journey is um, being honest with your um, journey <laughs> in that it's good and bad. You know, you you experience ups and downs as an artist. And um, a lot of why, I, a big part of why I create art as well is for my mental health. And I think that's something that we don't, as artists, really speak about openly. And I think it's okay <laughs> to speak mm -hmm. about it because it's realistic. I mean, I know there's other people out there that struggle as well. And um, so it's not a bad thing. <laughs> and it's okay to be vulnerable, like you said. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, again, thinking about, so I grew up on the res and I, I kind of had this unstable childhood and I know that um, there are kids like me still home on the res. And so I think it's okay to be honest and open about, you know, the things I may have experienced. So, and let them know that through art, um, I've learned a lot and I've turned it around and I'm still, it's still a huge journey, you know, it never ends, but um art is healing <laughs> um it's hard to like even explain that how healing it is um but i know like specifically you know when you're sitting down listening to music beating or quilling um you're relaxed and you're calm and it's therapeutic and um you get to see what you're made of like you're making this thing and um yeah it's like a challenge and then if you create and if you you know finish it how awesome is that and look i made a thing and it's like yeah and then i'm gonna make more things because i i enjoy the feeling of um feeling better and you know this euphoric feeling and also just joy and being connected um to your traditions and feeling close to your people and your grandmothers and, you know, I, yeah, I could go on and on, <laughs> but yeah. No, I think that's, uh, thank you for being so honest about that. That's, that's, that's very kind of you, I think. And also just bringing up that, that mental, that, uh, sort of personal care and the, and the, and the personal health and the community health and how it's sort of all, tied together. And I think, you know, I was speaking earlier today with another artist about the Our Home exhibit that I kind of promoted at the beginning of this. And I, uh, you know, we developed that um, two years ago now, I think, uh, you know, time, I'm in the COVID time warp. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we all are. <laughs> we all are. Uh, you know, and that was developed by, by three uh, Native uh, colleagues of mine, Native women colleagues of mine here that I really have so much respect for. And we looked at, in the in one case, we looked at, at first we thought we were going to explore leadership. What, what does leadership look like in communities? And it ended up being more like looking at community care. How do people step up for their community? And we were looking at that through clothing. And so that's just one of the most uh, telling and important parts of that exhibit, I think, because we're looking at someone who was part of the Chippewa Indian Nursing Service in the 1930s, and someone who was um, a 
a war veteran. And then, you know, we're also looking at a men's society shirt from the mid 1800s. And we're looking at all these different ways that people came and stood up for their communities. So if I just would say for uh, any non-native viewers out there that haven't experienced uh, that or haven't had the luck and the joy to experience seeing that in native communities, it's something that's, that's part of the community. Yeah. And I think, you know, when we talk about art, it's not, no native artist I know is just making art for themselves. It's not like I'm gonna strike out and, and um, make a living and I'm gonna strike out and I'm gonna do this and get rich. It's, it's to, like you said, be connected to traditions and people. Yeah. 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 Love you sharing that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, do you feel like we should take some questions from the, yeah. from the audience if we have them? They'll come sure. up, I'll read them um, to you. Okay, I mentioned decolonizing diets. Are there any cookbooks you recommend? I don't know, are there any you recommend? Uh, no, I mean, to be honest, I don't know of any. Well, actually, yeah. I should say, I know that um, Sean Sherman, I believe his, his name, the chef at Owamani, he just opened right, um, right the restaurant. I know he has a um, cookbook. I don't own it. I haven't looked in it, but I know what he promotes <laughs> and it's um, decolonizing diets and going back to, you know, um, the foods that we, you know, have abandoned and we're trying to reclaim and re-promote. So that's the only one I know of. Yeah. And there are a number of other native, um, uh, authors and, and uh, chefs that we've worked with here. Uh, Hyde Erdrick has that book, Original Local, that the press, MHS Press did. And there's also some really interesting uh, historic books, too, that aren't cookbooks, but that do like uh, Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden, where they talk about, you know, practices, food practices. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I can contribute to this. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, this is a good one. How has language played a role within your artwork? And I will have a story to add to that when you're done. Yeah, that is an awesome um, question. So, you know, as an artist, you spend a lot of time with your artwork and you're sitting in sometimes silence. Um, sometimes, like, I can't listen to music or podcasts anymore. I just kind of need silence. But, um, and then your mind starts to wander. And so when I started creating work, um, I started to wonder what, what are the words for the things that I'm using or for the things that I'm creating? How do we say this in um, Dakota? And um, so it triggered, you know, that, that avenue for me and made me um, curious. And so, in the last 10 years, as I've been creating things, I have picked up a lot of words um, just by sitting here um, making art. <laughs> and so um, that helped, uh, obviously it helps me learn my language. Um, and then I can in turn teach my daughter how to say it too, so yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say. I think you're you're answering that question in a really humble way, and I know like you you don't want to be uh, boastful when you talk about that. Because, um, but but probably the cutest thing that's ever happened in the artist in residence program is your your daughter at the time made food out of perler beads, like the yeah the, the yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you. I'm sure you remember now that I mention it, but. Uh -huh. um, you worked with the, the with the Dakota Lakota language uh, preschool. And yeah, I remember you know teaching them language of traditional foods, and then I remember little watermelons on a stick and things like that as well. Yeah, that was really cool, and that helped bring my daughter into you know being curious and making this a fun thing. You know, at first I was trying. She even. Um, Narr not narrated, but illustrated um, a little booklet that we used when we went into the language nest. Um, so I let her draw all the things that I was, you know, teaching about. 
Um, and then I let her make those perler bead creations. And I made sure that both her and I knew how to say those words before we went into the language nest because you can't speak English in the language nest. So it was, um, um, it was a challenge, but it was awesome because it makes you, it makes you use um, what you know. Mm -hmm. And although you might sound very choppy and you're just making commands or whatever, um, you're using the language. And then when you lose, you use the language, you're, you're feeling empowered by it. And these little kids are looking at you and it's, it's just a really good feeling. So yeah, um, my daughter knew all these, you know, how to say cherry, watermelon, orange, banana, <laughs> uh -huh. all of those. I don't know if she remembers anymore, but she remembers that experience. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. All right, any other questions? Okay. Oh, besides the Historical Society, where has your artwork been on display? Um. So I do, um, as I said, I'm a ledger artist, so I do um, gallery shows. So um, my, I don't know specifically, but um, my artwork, my ledger art has been in different um, states, <laughs> um, but right now i can think of i do have a quilt purse well it's a double-sided woman's purse on display at mia and um god it's it's crazy yeah um, don't, don't be humble it's <laughs> it's on display at the minneapolis institute of arts mia like when you walk in it is featured prominently yeah yeah it, it's so flattering you know honestly you have to uh, i am flattered and i know how much work went into that bag and so i'm so glad that it is in a place situated in a way where like you can't miss it you're almost forced to stop when you're going up those steps because it's right there in the middle and so that is so cool in the way that you know they may go up to it see what it's made of see where i come from and then wonder about not only me or my artwork but my community or dakota people in general so right, right. that's a good place for people to meet dakota people right at the beginning yes <laughs> huh yeah that's right okay um, if you could have your dream collaboration with or change to museums like MNHS who hold Dakota or other indigenous collections, what would it be? And this probably goes back to the, like when we were talking about the way we manage, uh, or, or it could be broader than that too. A dream collaboration, exhibit collections, anything. Oh, like in terms of if I wanted to have you know uh an exhibit what would that consist of yeah or oh my gosh i feel like and it's gonna sound like biased or something <laughs> but just um uh, i would love to just have a a dakota exhibit um in terms of, i mean there's so many we don't just have art you know there's like you know singers and dancers and all the uh high tanners you know like all these talented people that could bring so much um in one place to teach um what we're all about you know um not only just like pat and you know past things but contemporary things as well you know how we we are evolving as people or artists or you know Things like that. I don't know if that answered the question, but. I think it's a great answer. All right. Um, has your approach to how you make art changed based on the medium you were using between beadwork and ledger art? Yeah. <laughs> um, ledger art is drawing. So I could be sitting on the couch watching crime shows and sketching <laughs> you know like 
I, I don't know. I'm just one of those people that can't relax either. So I always have to, makes me think of my grandma because my grandma used to sit on the couch and she would twiddle her thumbs. <laughs> and so I feel like that's kind of how I am. I, I just have to keep doing something with my hands um, while I'm trying to relax, but I don't. So yeah, Ledger Art, you can kind of like take your tablet your sketchbook wherever you go and if you're you know you're listening to somebody or you have a i don't know a moment you can sketch you know or you're inspired by something you can sketch right there um beadwork that requires me to kind of come into my art room here and clean up a space and look at my beads and figure out what i want to do or <laughs> what i have what i have the um supplies to make or how I'm feeling like do I want to make something tiny or do I want something that you know like a lot of uh, jewelry or kind of go off my mood all right what's the most memorable experience you've had working with museums and their collections mm. I don't know, you know, just in general being, I had no idea that you could actually go into a museum and be allowed into collections. I had no idea that was a thing. And um, so I, I, and I'm not trying to um, flatter you, Ben, <laughs> <laughs> but I had a great experience through Minnesota, I did. Your collections um, were exactly where I wanted to. I'm glad I got to start there because um, there was a lot of floral work. Um, and I was happy that it even existed, you know, that it was somewhere in some collections. And then realizing that it was not only in your collections, it was in other collections in different states where, you know, Dakota people uh, were either pushed or lived. So um, I had a really good experience with you guys. Um, and you and Rita were super helpful. You always were open to changing your schedule because my schedule was always erratic. And <laughs> so um, it made me feel, I think that kind of set the bar for how um, I wanted other people to treat other artists or other Dakota people who had questions and wanted to go into um, collections too. So um, I, I hope you're being nice to everybody. <laughs> uh, oh, no, I, I do appreciate that. We've worked, a lot of us have worked really hard at, at um, trying to be more transparent about like your question earlier, why is this stuff here? And then also more accessible. And we're sort of looking through some of the tours and, and just the, the community groups that we've hosted and really it's been it has been thousands of Dakota people that have been through it since I've since I've been here in the last decade and that is really uh, that's an accomplishment that I feel good about. Yeah. yeah so. I'm so happy to hear that because like I said, you know, the old items that are there need that interaction, especially from the people that they come from. You know, and Absolutely. so, yeah, it's a good thing. It is. All right. Oh, where can we support and purchase your artwork, Holly? Um, so you can find me on social media. <laughs> I'm on Instagram under Holly Young Artist. And then I'm on Facebook as well under Holly Young. It's a business page. And then I also kind of have a very simple website. Um, I think it's www.hyoungatartspan.com. I'm not sure that's the right address, but I am on Artspan. Okay. That's great. Oh, do you have other indigenous artists um, that inspire you? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> I um yeah, I, you know, when I first started wanting to get into art, I would just watch so many artists and uh it was just always like 
so blown away by all the things that they created. Um, but um, the Growing Thunders family, um, super talented, super beautiful things, creations that they make. Um, I love that they promote um, creating as a family and um, and they're very knowledgeable with you know what they're making and they know the lessons behind it um so yeah those ladies are awesome um as far as ledger art <laughs> my friend john pepion um was is an awesome artist and i look up to him and i admire um, the work that he does and he's a mentor to me learn a lot from him. Um, Sarah Agaton House, I just worked on a mural with her. She's um, awesome. She just knows how to, I don't know, just navigate her way through the art world almost flawlessly. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm sure there's so many, oh my goodness, I, I follow a lot of um, Danae and Gwichin bead workers on um, Instagram. They are awesome. One lady, her name is Elaine Alexi. She's witching. She does beautiful work. So yeah, I just, I'm drawing a blank right now, but um, yeah, there's a lot of- That's lovely. That's and lovely. you're right. There is a lot. I think there's like, a, I think it's fair to say there's like a renaissance going on and, and social media plays a role I think in inspiring people too, and I and I do think about, um, you know, you know, Joe, Joe Horse Capture and some of the other folks, honestly, that that were in these positions in it were and are curators and just use their social media to start sharing out. Yes, this and getting people excited about it, um, because you know, from a museum perspective, we're like, well, we'll digitize it, we'll put it in the research database and then it'll be available. People can come to it, but like. But that doesn't draw people <laughs> in, yeah. <laughs> if you digitize it, they will come. You have to, you know, have that piece. And I really just can't, I can't, uh, I don't want to like, I, social media has played an incredible role, I think, in, in uh, influences this, this, this artistic sort of renaissance that's happening right now. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, have you seen the artists that are have been in Vogue and all yeah. these these magazines for yeah. fashion? Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Like, yeah. who would have ever thought that would ever happen? That's so empowering and inspirational. And, you know, indigenous people are some of the most talented and artistic people ever. And um, I don't think the art is promoted in that way, you know, but now we're changing that via via social media. So yeah, it makes everything that much more accessible to the to the community and to you know non non community members. Yeah, it's so quick. You just do a search, go find that person. <laughs> yeah. We're we're alive in amazing times. Mm -hmm. Um we have only about a minute and a half left okay. so do you have any parting thoughts before i close up i do not i just want to say thank you though for the opportunity to you know speak and invite people um to be curious about where i come from and who i come from and um the art that i do and um encourage you all to support indigenous artists um because they put their heart and energy into everything they make and it's it's worth it it's um yeah well thank you again for being so open and inviting and uh, willing to share with us and um it's just really nice to see you on a personal yeah. level, you know it's we don't we're not traveling like we used to with, with i know we we got we got to go back to that Turkish place. <laughs> That's right. For lunch? <laughs> yes. Have food. That sounds great. <laughs> After all of this is over. I know. That would be lovely. 
Um, so I'm just going to close up here with like 20 seconds left and just say that we do have um, a short three minute survey. If anybody want, watching wants to participate in that link is in the chat. And then you can also join us in November as we kick off Native American Heritage Month with a community day, community day, Saturday, November 6th at the History Center in St. Paul. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Yeah, don't shout. Don't shout.